Hey, hi everybody. Welcome to the WG4 webinar. This is titled uh, A Minimalist Approach to Workflow Interoperability. Um, our speaker today will be Richard Eckhart Castillo. Um, this webinar is offered by the Open Minded Project on text and data mining of scholarly publications in Europe. Um, and it will be recorded and it will be made publicly available at a later time. By participating in the webinar today, you're agreeing to, the web, to this recording and publishing this recording, including everything you contribute to the discussion. Uh, so please ensure your microphones are muted during the presentation and whenever you're not speaking. Uh, we will have some time afterwards for questions and discussion and all of that. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to Richard, who will be talking us through the webinar that he's prepared. So go for Richard. So thank you, Matt. Hello, everybody. I am I have the pleasure to welcome you today to the uh, to our webinar titled "The Minimalist Approach to Workflow Interoperability." This is uh, um, this is part of our work on um, the interoperability of annotations and workflows within the Open Minted project. So, in a nutshell, um, what is Open Minted? So, Open Minted brings together text and data mining capabilities from all over Europe. And we are seeking for an interoperability between uh, the uh, frameworks and components that are contributed by the different partners within our consortium and potentially beyond. So in the current state, uh, there are already many components interoperable within several frameworks, such as uh, Rima or Argo or Gate. Um, however, there's a wide range of different data formats, schemas, technologies, and policies associated um, with, with these technologies. So uh, our approach is that we want to bring these together, although we want to avoid the creation of yet another format or schema. And instead, we would like to focus on improving the conceptual cross-framework interoperability and demonstrating and investigating this through the implementation of a prototype. A prototype is uh, with respect to what we are currently aiming for. It's not that the open minted platform would be a prototype. So it's a, it's a prototype that we, we will evolve later into the platform. Um, so why is the landscape out there so heterogeneous? So uh, the main reason for that is that uh, there's a lot of parallel development going on. So major frameworks such as Gate and Uima have been developed in parallel and are parallel efforts going on even within domains such as the semantic web technology uh, context where we see uh, for example, open annotation um, standard being developed in parallel to standards such as the um, NLP interchange format NIF. And uh, for each of the different technologies and frameworks, there are specific pro pros and cons depending on the particular use case. So, for example, Yuma is meant for scale out. Um, Gate is very good when it comes to user interfaces and the semantic web efforts are very good when it comes to um, gathering information in a machine readable way from the web. And additionally, basically everybody who participates in the domain is creating their ad hoc implementations. So that's why I find lots of different tools, everybody using their own implementations and formats and uh, they're not interoperable. Another reason is that um, not only there are the different frameworks, but there are also different domain concept, uh, conceptualizations, which we call type systems or schemas. So frameworks typically provide a certain meta model, uh, like a basic model for annotation that can, for example, include how is an annotation attached to an object. Um, um, and at the bottom, we see a couple of examples of those. So uh, in, a, in a very generic um, a meta model, we would have an annotation which could be everything and it points to some object. In a slightly more refined model, we would maybe have a span that it points to a piece of text through character offsets. And uh, in a yet more refined uh, way, 
um, where we actually include schema information. Um, we would have, a, let's say, named entity with particular features that is linked to, to a specific text. So um, these are um, the, the more these things are refined, the more we get into the, the into the area of specific communities and domains, and be different groups again working in parallel define their own um, their own conceptualizations of their domains. So they might be describing similar things, but um, they use different terminology for it. Uh, additionally, whatever these communities or, or uh, what is developed in these communities or domains um, is is fixed to the tasks that they are working on. So such pre-built schema tasks or type systems that are defined here do not cover new tasks because nobody has worked on them so far. So users define new type systems when or schemas when they start working on new tasks. And again, they do this in parallel. They don't coordinate them with each other, which again leads to parallel, parallel development. Finally, um, there are, all this information can be represented in all kinds of different formats. So there are generic formats, which are very flexible, but typically quite verbose and complex. Uh, we see on the, on the bottom of the screen uh, various of those. So there's an RDF format, there is a, a, a UEMAXMI format. Uh, we, these are very generic, they are open um, to a lot of customization, but they are very verbose to work with and to look at. Task specific formats, such for example the Connell 2006 formats, they are very concise and uh, expressive, um, but they are not very flexible. So um, again, for different uh, uses and by different communities, very different formats are, um, are preferred. So for example, here we see also an example of a binary format, which is very efficient for transferring over the network, um, but is not very good, for example, for human readability. So there are lots of reasons why people do parallel development and why they um, specialize into certain directions. So when we want to take, uh, to turn all this into, in, into a, an interoperable uh, solution, um, by taking uh, components and data from different sources and putting them together, there are certain questions that arise. For example, can these components be packaged and distributed in a uniform way? Can they be cursed into a common lifecycle model? For example, deployment, configuration, running, and destruction. Can they be configured through a joint model for parameters and their values? What, a, what kind of metadata is necessary in order to locate the components, to deploy them, and to run them? And is that, actual, is that metadata that we need actually available for all the components that we would like to integrate? Uh, furthermore, related to the input and output of the components, um, can these inputs and outputs be converted to each other, be mapped to each other at all? Um, if they can, can we do it with no loss of information or at least minimal loss of information? So does, does data, how can we avoid data getting lost in translation? Are there specific commonalities or unique points in the way that different communities or groups or technologies represent the data? What level of flexibility or potentially ambiguity is necessary in order to fulfill our tasks? And um, can we handle the mapping of the meta model independently of the mapping of specific schemas or type systems? So how are we going to about to answer this? So first thing we could do is we could take up everything that is out there and try to integrate it into a full-fledged workflow system with a great user interface. And, uh, but currently we are not doing that because um, it's a lot of work to do. And uh, actually we are kind of still deciding on which workflow system to use in Open Minted. So an um, other option would be we could kind of build everything on paper and think through it theoretically, but the devil lies in the details. And 
um, experience tells us that there are lots, many eventualities to, to consider, and we might just easily miss certain aspects if we don't really implement um, the conversions and the interoperability uh, mappings that, that we are interested in. So what we came up with is the idea of creating a minimal sandbox environment for integration. And this is what we cover for most of the rest of the presentation. It's called Open Minted Script. Another question is, what should we actually integrate? So integrating uh, tools and services for data mining, um, off-the-shelf tools, as I said before, they are not easily interoperable. So in order to make them interoperable, we, we usually create wrappers around them that make them interoperable in a given context. For example, within UAIMA, using a certain type system or within gate or within some other platform or technology framework. However, turning tools into components is quite a lot of work. So fortunately, quite a few people have already done that. So there are a number of component collections out there based on different technologies. For example, Argo from Manchester, CTEX from Apache, ClearTK, DK Procore from Darmstadt, JCore from uh, Jena, um, Gabe from Sheffield, LabsGrid, uh, which is a cooperative project by uh, several universities in the United States, you compare again from Manchester, and many more. So instead of trying to integrate individual components, let's try to integrate whole component collections at a time. Since they already contain interoperable components, that should level the heterogeneous landscape quite a bit. So next, let's have a look at Open Minted Script. So Open Minted Script is a minimal domain-specific language for building um, NLP workflows from heterogeneous components. On the right side of the slide, we see a rough overview of the architecture. The light parts are parts that are not being discussed on the present slide. The dark part here, the domain-specific language, DSL, is highlighted which is what, uh, what this slide discusses. So what we see here is a short script, which um, is essentially a groovy script, uh, which uh, describes um, how a document is read. Uh, it applies first um, uh, uh, a segmenter, a tokenizer, a sentence splitter that is from the DK Pro framework. After that, it applies a part of speech tagger from the gate um, component collection. And finally, it writes out the results using a gate XML exporter, again from gate. So this already shows how we imagine to uh, bring components from different sources together into a single uh, concise language to work with. So this pipeline that we have just defined is executed by a minimal engine. So there's no scale out or anything like that. It's basically just running one component after the other in a sequence. And um, because we said we don't want to integrate individual components, but we want to integrate whole component collections at a time, each of the components um, is connected to a framework adapter. So for example, we have an adapter for gate, for DK Pro Core, for LSP web services, and so on. So whenever the engine is talking to component, it's not talking to component directly, but via the means of the adapter, which abstracts away um, specific uh, aspects such as the component lifecycle and the data models. When the paired data is processed within the pipeline, we apply data converters lazily to convert, convert data between components as necessary. So for example, uh, here we uh, apply the, the, the tokenized and sex, uh, sentence splitter from TK Pro Core, which is a UIMA component, and the engine transparently converts the data model from the MACAS to the gate uh, data model before it passes on the data to the uh, gate part of speech tagger. Where did the components come from? So how do we discover them? Um, for this, the open minted script includes a minimal uh, catalog, which kind of substitutes a full-fledged registry service. Um, and in this catalog, we have information about uh, that we actually need within the context of, of OpenScript to work with a component. So that kind of answers the, the question, what is the minimal metadata that we need? Uh, Open Minted Script relies to a large degree currently on Maven. So what is included here 
is the name of the component. It is uh, the group ID, artifact ID, and version of, uh, of a library, which is in the Maven repository. And it is the name of a class that implements the component, which is located within the library, within the Maven, Maven artifact. This is an example of a, of a description for a processing component. Um, for, we have a similar description for um, data um, readers and writer components where the name is basically the name of the format. We also have uh, group IDs, Maven, Maven coordinates that indicate in which libraries this implementation contained. And we have a write, uh, classes for a reader in the, of this format and for a writer of this format. So this is the minimal information that we need. The rest of the metadata we can usually obtain by inspecting the respective implementation classes and annotations contained there. As I just said, uh, components are currently um, imagined to be packaged as Maven artifacts, although this does not have to stay in this way in the future. We'll probably extend that. Um, and at the moment, this focuses mainly on Gate and Dkflow Core. Uh, and Gate is currently in the phase of transition, transitioning to Maven, so the Official gate distribution does not contain Maven artifacts yet, but hopefully the next one. <laughs> um, there is already uh, there are some snapshots builds of Maven that we are of gate that we are currently working with um, to in, in this experiment to um, to see how well the Mavenization of gate um, can work in this context. The nice thing about uh, using Maven or using any kind of repository-based uh, approach, could also be Docker, for example, is that whenever we need a component, it is dynamically acquired uh, by OpenMinted Script and um, is downloaded and run. So that kind of substitutes for us or simulates for us a bit of a, a cloud-oriented um, scenario where we are working with uh, dynamic deployment. So what is the relationship of all of this to the OpenMinted platform or infrastructure? So OpenMinted Script is not the OpenMinted platform. It's a sandbox. It allows us to do rapid prototyping and investigation of interoperability problems. It's also very useful to do automatic unit and integration testing across different frameworks. Um, but it's not just a toy. We expect and actually do uh, isolate parts of it that can be evolved um, into later stages of the open minted platform, such as the framework adapters, data converters, access to repositories, and in particular, the ability to run um, unit testing across framework boundaries. So this is whatever, whatever uh, workflow engine we will finally use in the project. Um, these will be uh, key points um, to be transferred uh, into that. Otherwise, uh, we use OpenMinted Script to learn how to answer the initial questions. So some answers and insights that we have so far. Regarding uniform packaging, Maven seems to work quite well for Java-based components and to a limited degree even for native components that we can access through JNI um, and that can be statically compiled. However, we are look, uh, plan to look into Docker for the more general case where we want, for example, to work with uh, Python implementations which, um, which require alternative packaging. Another alternative could be Conda, probably combining all of these together, um, using Maven and Conda to, um, maybe to, to populate Docker images. Uh, what about a common lifecycle? So although there are minor lifecycle differences, for example, between Yuma and Gate, a simplified uh, lifecycle such as configure, deploy, run, destroy seems to work in general. So one difference between Yuma and Gate is that in Gate, certain parameters can be joined um, after the instantiation of a component, and certain parameters can be set only during the instantiation of a component. Um, so but if we just configure, deploy, run, and destroy a component, this, this difference we can easily gloss over. So that seems to be quite okay. What about the joint parameter model? So a simplified model with key values seems to work quite well. Um, if we uh, restrict the number of parameter value types to, for example, string, integer, float, boolean, plus multiple values thereof, we can cover most cases. We do not cover all the cases, 
Um, so, for example, some frameworks support uh, structured, uh, structured uh, parameter values. Um, those would have to be coerced into a string, for example, um, in order to work with our reduced set. But looking at the different components that we have, it's a very small fraction of them that require parameter types that are not string integer, float, boolean, or lists thereof. What about the metadata? So we have quite a bit of metadata, but what is often a problem is that information about the input and output of components is missing. And also we do not know what kind of data, what type of information, what annotations does a component require in order to work and what kind of uh, output does it add um, in terms of annotation to the data. And also the absence of information about an annotation schema is at times problematic, uh, but we'll get into that in more detail a moment later. So model and schema mapping, um, although uh, gate and UEMA meta models look very similar. They're not equivalent yet. Um, but we have some uh, promising solutions uh, for schema mapping, which is what we are going to look at uh, next. Before we get to that, however, we have a short look at meta model mapping. So, what is meta model? Or what is a meta model? What is meta model mapping? A meta model defines how a schema can be built. So what type of information can be encoded? How are, they, how, how are things related to each other? Is there something like inheritance? What are the, what are the, possible, um, the, the possible types of uh, annotation features and so on? There are various models, uh, meta models out there, for example, annotation graphs, uh, which is uh, a concept on which gate is built, feature structures. Um, extension of feature structures used in UIMACAS, uh, all the ontology web language, and so on. So what is a schema? A schema defines what information is encoded. So for example, a concrete UIMA type system, a concrete XML schema definition, or a concrete OWL ontology. And these different um, Schemas or meta can be expressed again in uh, in various kinds of representation formats. So I can express a schema, for example, either in XML schema or in OWL. Um, although I have to what uh, we have to look that uh, these different schema languages have different models or meta models underlying them. So not all of the concepts are mappable to each other. However. Hypothesis is, why, why do we want to do this as, at all? So the hypothesis is, if we can establish equivalence at the meta model level between different frameworks and technologies, then we can reduce the mapping problem to the schema level. So what does it mean? Consider a heterogeneous pipeline setup where we use um, components from different sources and there's a conversion necessary uh, between different components. Um, if the meta models are equivalent, it's basically just a matter of unpack unpackaging the information from one model and packaging it back into the other model. And uh, if not, um, we have a risk that uh, we will lose some uh, information in the conversion. Right? So in this pipeline here, we see a reader produces a model one, let's say Rima, uh, which is uh, which contains information in a certain schema that is converted, let's say, to, to gate that is processed by a gate component um, and it produces a, a, a gate a model which also contains the same schema. So the schema information, the data encoded in the model is equivalent, but the way it's represented is slightly different. And then again, we convert it into a human model or a model one and pass it to the next processor and so on. So how does that look in practice? Let's take, for example, UEMA and gate. We make a simple comparison. So on the left side, we have a UEMA feature structure, which contains the type of the feature structure. Here, for example, a named entity. It has an address, which is kind of the ID in UEMA, uh, a begin and end position, um, which points into the text. And then there is um, this. So this, these uh, dark colored um, um, properties, they are actually part of the meta model. And then we have uh, information that is part of the schema, which is here, for example, the entity value. 
And in Gate, it looks quite similar. Um, it, where the where in UEMA the begin and end are actually integers that point into the text. This character offsets gate has the concept of a node, which which is a kind of a pointer or, or uh, an anchor in the text that uh, it points to, but it's conceptually equivalent um, from my perspective at least uh, to the character offsets. And we also have a um, have the feature value here, entity value, and it has a string. What we notice here is that uh, so the gate and UEMA meta models are quite similar. However, uh, the UEMA model is very schema driven. So all of the potential features uh, are need to be defined in a schema. And from that schema, we also get the type. What is the possible type of this feature? Whereas in gate, um, the type of a feature is not really constrained by default. So it's schema free. We can also add new uh, features anytime we want. There's nothing constraining us from that. Um, but uh, still, they look very similar. So it should be quite easy to map one to the other, right? Without any problem. So we can, we can just convert the, op the upper part, the dark part of the information from UEMA to gate or from gate to UEMA uh, at the meta model level. And the rest of the information is just basically copied over. Sounds good, but it's not that easy. Um, let's take a, a, let's consider a slightly more complex example. Here we have the email feature structure for a constituent, so for a, a node in a parse tree. And uh, such a constituent has pointers to children. So what are the, the different parts it contain it consists of? And in, in your email, we, we can know from the schema that um, the list of children is actually pointers to different uh, other feature structures of type constituent. So we have a list of constituents that are the children. That's nice. When we look at gate, um, we also have the children, but it's just a list of numbers. And uh, we actually do not know at this time, at this point, how the numbers can, can be interpreted. So this is not part of the meta model. This is part of the schema. Um, of the user defined type. And we, when we want to do a conversion based on the meta model level, we have absolutely no clue that this list of, of, of numbers should be converted into a list of pointers to other feature structures. We could be tempted just to convert it into a list of numbers. So how do we trust that? Uh, we could enforce a schema and inside the schema mark this as a list of, let's say, ID ref values, but that would be against the idea of having a schema free system. So what we came up with is um, we can actually determine the type of these values by look, of, of these values by looking at at the, uh, at the values themselves. So we see it's uh, here it's a list of integers. Of course that's kind of uh, not what we want to hear. What we want to hear these are references to other to other annotations. Um, so the idea we had was to actually extend the gate meta model to introduce a special uh, type reference at the meta model level, which we would, which basically would wrap um, the ID of the of the target annotation, and in this way marks it as a special as an annotation reference. So it's information that is not contained in the schema, but when we look at the value of the children, we see that it's no longer a list of numbers, but it's a list of references. So we can, that way we can uh, encode the information, the missing information that this is a pointer to another annotation without having to establish a schema. And in that way, uh, we have a more equivalent um, meta models on both sides. So whether or not this will be actually implemented in that way uh, in gate, we will still have to see. So much for the meta model mapping. Now let's go over to the schema mapping. So as we said in the introduction, different parties provide different pre-built schemas for their communities and domains. So there's parallel development. Um, these schemas usually use different labels to refer to semantically similar concepts. For example, there can be a sentence in Argo, which is called Argo sentence and the same thing in DK Pro might just be called DK Pro core dot sentence, and in you compare it might be called a ser character sequence, which is essentially a sentence, but it's not called a sentence. So they're all quite similar, but how do we map? 
um, why do we not just throw away these existing schemas and invent new ones and try to get everybody to use that? So one thing is that people are there already people out there that rely on the schemas that are being used. So if we would just take them away from them and change them, we would be, we would be breaking stuff for people, which is not a nice way to treat the user base. Um, also, uh, scoping a schema to a particular project or community increases the flexibility um, and ability to innovate within that project or community within that scope, because um, there is less uh, coordination effort with other parties when a new feature or new type uh, is to be introduced, or if we just experiment with different ways of representing data. So how do we do the schema mapping? Uh, there are different approaches to do that. We could create dedicated conversion components that perform specific mappings from one schema to another. However, uh, the creation of such component requires um, that the, the creator knows how to program and it can be at times quite time intensive. We could also uh, not give the ability to, to um, do custom mappings, but we could just hard code uh, mappings between different uh, schemas into our workflow uh, system. Um, however, that doesn't develop well. And uh, we, we don't have necessarily uh, um, all the conversions available for, for, for when there are pe people contributing new types of components. So that's also a problem. So uh, what we were doing instead is implementing uh, a type mapper um, that uses a special language describing type mappings. And this is available in the Argo type mapper component. We'll have a look at how that works. So um, this is what we see here is an example of how the component, this type mapping component can be used in Open Minted Script. So we apply the type mapper and give it a mapping definition. And in this case, we say, um, please, please translate all instances of the uCompare sentence into instances of the DK Pro core sentence. So this is a simple, very simple mapping. And uh, in this case, the type mapper automatically com uh, just copies values of features that have common names. So what does it look like? Uh, starting from you compare sentence, this has a very simple annotation. It just has a begin and an end. Basically, the name of the type is changed by the mapper, but the values of the begin and end annotation are basically copied over. They have the same name. They will get the same value. What about more complex type mappings? So here we have the we have an example again in Open Minted Script of uh, converting a type from an example named entity type to a gene type, but only in those cases where the category feature of the named entity is actually gene. So we have two type systems here that use different um, design patterns. So in one case. Uh, the specific category of a named entity is encoded as a, as a category feature of the named entity type. And in the other type system, um, the specific category of a named entity is actually encoded in the type name. And we can probably expect that the gene here is inheriting from a more generic uh, named entity type. So the mapping describes here that the entity value of the named entity type uh, corresponds to the name of the gene. And what is also very interesting here is that um, the gene annotation uh, ha includes some metadata. So it includes metadata about the author and about the date at which um, the, uh, the annotation was created. And this is not an uh, actual feature of the gene type itself, but it's a, it's a reference to another metadata type. And we look in a, at the moment how that uh, looks in practice. Um, What's also interesting to note here is that if in the in the original named entity annotation, we do not have information about uh, the author. We just have information about when the annotation was created. So here in the mapping, we fill the author with a fixed string, in this case, John Doe, um, uh, in the, uh, as a creator, as part of the conversion process. So how does it look like? Um, we map basically one 
uh, named entity annotation into two new annotations. So one gene annotation and one metadata annotation that is referred to from the gene. So in that way we cannot cover only very simple um, uh, type mappings with uh, our Go type mapper, but we can actually uh, support uh, cases where one uh, type is, is broken down into multiple, multiple types or vice versa. All right, so far for the schema mapping. So some outlook, where is this going into the future? Um, so one thing uh, we want to do is to replace the uh, built-in catalog uh, in Open Minted Script by access to the uh, through access to, uh, to the Open Minted registry, so that we actually obtain information about the components directly from the registry, which will not only serve, uh, which will not only extend the um, the functionality of Open Minted Script, but actually is a, can be used as a test case for the Open Minted registry and its API. Um, we need to investigate additional uh, types of component repositories and packaging types. So I also ma already mentioned Docker, but potentially we could also look into support for UMAP pairs. And um, we talked a lot about mapping, but mapping is not really our goal. So we need to investigate how, based on the, info on the insights that we gain from our experiment here, how can we find approaches that reduce or avoid manual mapping? So one option could be to use the to create a set of, of built-in mappings for well-known component collections. Um, we could also consider exploiting external mapping information that is provided directly by the schema slash type system providers. For example, the labs exchange vocabulary or the DK Pro code type system make references to each other. They make references to NIF, they make references to ISOCAT. So um, there are linkings uh, to other uh, type systems. Maybe we can exploit those to generate uh, mapping descriptions so that who manages in the end, in the, end the, the mappings is, are not, is not with us, but it's the people that actually provide the type systems that would also be attractive. Um, or should we actually look into identifying kind of pivot types that we, would, um, that we would prefer at the level of a pipeline so that uh, instead of mapping between components, we map basically around every component um, but we should do that, if we wanted to do that, I think we should do that in a way where we do not uh, invent new types, but maybe where we take, um, kind of follow a bit the approach of the semantic web where, where micro, uh, micro schemas are defined. So uh, um, that we select uh, ways that uh, certain types of information are already represented and say, okay, so let's say for, for segmentation, for tokens and sentences, we will use um, the way that DK Pro is doing it. For medical information, uh, medical concepts, we will use uh, how, C how Apache CTEX is doing it. For genetic domain, um, uh, we will use it how in the way that uh, Argo is doing it and so on. Uh, so that could also be an option, but that's something we, we need to investigate further. So, and at this point, we come to the end of the presentation. Um, before we run into, uh, go over into the discussion section, I would just like to point out that there is another webinar next week on uh, text and data mining and probability at a legal level, rights, exceptions, and licenses, which will be held by Thomas Margoni.